Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. We are slowly but inevitably losing the generation of men who fought in and survived the last world war. And what we're left with are monuments to courage and to loss, like this one in central London, which is dedicated to the 55,000 young men who lost their lives serving in Britain's Bomber Command. My guest today is 96-year-old George Johnny Johnson, the last remaining British survivor of one of the most extraordinary, most famous aerial missions of World War II, the Dambusters Raid. It was costly and it wasn't entirely successful. So why has it become such a part of Britain's national folklore? Johnny Johnson, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. I want to begin by asking you whether you feel more pride or sadness that you are the last British dambuster. I think it's both. Pride, certainly, because I'm still able to support that squadron that I support and joined in that time. And while so many things happen in my favour, or seem to. I have to remind people, I'm the lucky one. I'm still alive. But it's not me, it's the squadron I represent. And that is what I want to do with the rest of my life now, or the rest of the work that I do. It's for representing that one particular squadron. Go back to 1943. You're a young bomb aimer, that's your job. Did you know what you were getting into when you and your crew were told that you were going into special training for a very special mission? Did you have any idea what it was None going to be? None whatsoever. And it was made perfectly clear that we wouldn't know until much later and that we were not to talk to anybody about the training that we were doing or anything about it. It was uh, top secret and in the end the inventor of this extraordinary bouncing bomb, the device that was supposed to breach these dams in yeah. Germany, Barnes Wallace, he met you all. He met the crews before you went on the mission. So I suppose it was then that you understood what was going on. You know, then we had some conjecture after that meeting. And the immediate one was, uh, it was to be attacks on the um, German battleships, notably the Tirpitz. Because with that system, we were actually dropping the bomb some 400 yards short of the target. Mm. And it bounced its way mm. across the water, um, hit the target and sank and then exploded. And we thought that would be give us time um, for attacking the Tirpitz to drop, le release the bomb and get away before we got into their heavy defences area. And it wasn't until the next day, on the Sunday, when we went into briefing, when we found out how wrong we could be. Yes, it wasn't the warship, it was the dam. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, when I've read about the extraordinary demands that were being made of the pilots and the crews, and the plane itself, because you were having to fly so low, and you were having to avoid so many different obstacles, including church spires and electricity lines, to get to the precise point to drop the bombs. It seems to me you and the crew surely must have felt that this was a mission that could well end in your death. No, yeah. never entered our mind. And I don't think it did any of the crew. And that, I'm sure, would stem from our confidence in Joe. The pilot. And yes, that's right. And that was the way I'm sure the crew worked all the time. And it got to the stage where that flying, the low flying that you talked about, from my point about, was wonderful. I'm in the most comfortable 
positioning the aircraft. In this case, lying down all the time, and the ground that the ground is just whizzing past as you're going over. A wonderful, exhilarating experience. Well, that's all very well when you're doing it in training. But on the night itself, in May 1943, your particular mission was to go after the, the Sorper Dam. Yeah, yeah. And as I understand it, you, as the bomb aimer, insisted that your pilot, Joe, make 10 runs before he got it absolutely right in terms of positioning mm -hmm. so you could release the bomb. To my mind, and I'm sure to Joe's as well, we didn't talk about it. I'm sure we were gone on a mission, a special mission. Our job was to make sure that we did it right. And when we got to the Zorpa and discovered what that entailed, we'd already been disappointed at briefing by learning that we wouldn't be using the bombing techniques that we've been practicing for all those, those six weeks. But um, it was going to be an estimated drop eventually. Uh, we were not spilling the bomb at all. It was no. going to be an inert drop. We were going to fly down the side of one hill with our port outer engine over the dam itself and fly along the dam and estimate to drop the bomb as nearly as possible to the center as you could. If I wasn't satisfied, I called dummy run. If Joe wasn't satisfied, he just pulled away and left me to call dummy run. After uh, the sixth or seventh of these, voice from the rear turret, won't somebody get that bum out of here? And I had to realize how to become the most unpopular member of crew in double quick time. Mm. But we were there to do a specific job. And to my mind, we had to do that job. And I'm sure the same was true as far as Joe was concerned. But there were 19 Lancaster bombers involved in the Dambuster raid. Eight of them did not come back. That's true. And 56 men didn't come back either. Three were captured, but 53 were killed. That's right. More than one third of the entire crew involved in That's the mission. Right. That's right. How did you feel about the scale of the losses that your team took? Devastated at the time. A, a complete and utter shock. And Barnes Wallace... The inventor of the in, bomb. ...burst into tears and said, I've killed all those young men. I'll never do anything like that again. Johnny, you dropped your bomb and it was a direct hit on the Zorpa Dam. But in the end, that dam was not breached. No. The other two dams were yeah. destroyed. Mm. And the Mona Dam, it led, when it was breached, it led to huge amounts of water filling the valley for miles and miles. Thanks. When you flew back from your sortie, you saw... Yeah, indeed, yes. What did it feel like when you saw that this amazing mission with Barnes Wallace's extraordinary bouncing bomb, it had worked, it had destroyed the, the Mona Dam. What were your feelings? To me, it was the highlight of that operation, to see the actual result of success of part of it. We knew by radio broadcast that the Moan had been breached. We knew also that the Ada had been breached by radio broadcast. But approaching the Moan, or what was the Moan, was just like an inland sea. Hmm. There was water everywhere. But it wasn't easy. It had cost lives. Did it surprise you? Uh, the reaction to the Dambusters raid, because it was big news at the time. The, the British wartime press was so pleased to have this sort of yeah, yeah. triumph to crow about. Yeah. And then, of course, after the war, it was perhaps the most famous single aerial mission that had been flown, and it was celebrated. And, of course, in the end, it was made into a film. 
Did that surprise you, the degree to which it became part of the myth, the British myth of the war? I don't think it surprised me. But I have some grave misgivings about that particular period after the war, about the group of people that I call retrospective historians. And um, they were a group of them, one or two of them anyway, who claimed the Dam's Raid should never have taken place. It achieved nothing. It cost an awful lot of money in the training of special aircraft, the training of the crews, and danger to the crews themselves, mm. an awful lot of lives and aircraft lost as well. I used to say, if I ever met one of those characters, I'd hope my hands were tied behind my back, because I wouldn't be quite sure what I'd do with them. But, but Johnny, don't they have a point about the Dambusters raid? Because in the end, you did breach two of the three dams, and you did destroy some factories and some coal mines, and it should be said you also killed more than a thousand Absolutely. German people. Oh, yes, indeed. But, but according to the to Albert Speer and other senior Nazis, the German war effort wasn't really put back very much. And in fact, they, well, that... they rebuilt the factories and, and all of the infrastructure within five months. There are at least four reasons why, yes, it was a good raid. And the first is that it showed Hitler and the German hierarchy that what they thought was impregnable, the Royal Air Force could get through and destroy. Secondly, it meant that the skilled workmen that were being employed building an anti-invasion wall up the coast had to be pulled in to help to repair the dams. And thirdly, it did some damage to the factories themselves. It did, did it decrease the output, not as much as we would like, but it did decrease the output some, some, somewhat. And I think finally, the best impression was the effect of the morale on the people of this country. Because, as you mentioned, the papers next morning were absolutely full of it. Mm. And it happened so close to and the success of Alamein, that it raised the question, is this the turning point of the war? But there's another way of looking at this, Johnny, and it's not just about the Dambuster raid, but it's about bomber command in general. And of course, you, as a young bomb aimer, were involved in many sorties, many raids, in the period from 42 to 45, right across Germany and I believe Italy as well. Yeah. And it has to be said, you and your crews were responsible for the deaths of many thousands of civilians, as well as military personnel. And you've had many years to reflect on this. Do you have in you any sense of remorse or, or regret or guilt for those deaths? We didn't start the war. If you are threatened by war, you have to defend yourself. You have to defend your own country. And you have to do it by whatever means you can. And the example had been set by Hitler himself. The way he bombed our cities, London, Coventry, Liverpool, and the rest of them, regardless of human life or anything else. That was the sort of thing which had to be fought against. And one of the ways to fight against it was a reprisal of that sort of attack. And that's why, eventually, Bomber Command became I think, but wrongly criticised for the way they attacked the, uh, the Germans. I was there to do a job. That was what I was there for. That was what I joined for. It was my way of being able to help to get back at Hitler and what he had started with his attack on our country. He was my pet enemy and that was the way it stayed the whole time.
So when you saw the broken dams and you saw the villages being swept away by the waters, that you just closed your mind to the fact that civilians would be down there drowning? Didn't, didn't cross my mind at all, I'm afraid. I begin to wonder, frankly, <laughs> um, as a young child, I had a pretty horrible childhood. Mm. Um, and I found that I was left with a father who, in the first place, thought I was a mistake anyway. I was the sixth, of, of ch sixth the youngest of six children. And he beat me often, regularly. And I sometimes wonder, was emotion beaten out of me at that stage? Mm. But I felt so little at that time. Well, here's a question about your emotions right after the war or at the end of the war, because it's clear, as I talked about Bomber Command and its role in the war, yeah. that there was an ambivalence in Britain about it. And even Churchill, when he made his victory speech, he saluted the efforts of so many different uh, branches of the military, but he did not go out of his way to salute the work of Bomber Command. Yep. And in some ways, it seems there was a, a sense that Bomber Command, it, with its, particularly its targeting of civilians in Dresden and Hamburg and some other German cities, had gone too far, had broken a moral code. Were you angry with Churchill that he didn't thank Bomber Command specifically? I was angry with Churchill. Always have been. But I think since after the war, the first time we went back to Zorpa on a, on a television program, mm. the uh, cameraman and I were walking across the dam. Mm. He said, stop here, Johnny. I reckon this is where you dropped your bomb. And I stopped, looked over the side, and I was dropping that bomb again, just like that. And then I walked over to the other side and I saw that lovely valley going down there. And I said, you know, I'm going, Jazz, I, I'm almost glad we didn't breach this dam. Had we done so, this valley would have been completely ruined. Okay, it could have been rebuilt, but it'd never have been the same. And it made me think more mm. about the after effects of war Mm. And about war itself. It didn't make me think any the less of our war effort, something we had to fight for our own defence, that was it. I just want to quote you the words of one historian, Richard Overy, who's written a lot about Bomber Command and about the morality of some of the decisions taken, for example, the firebombing of, of Dresden and Hamburg. Yes, yes. And he, he says <laughs> that we need to be open and honest, that that the British decision was specifically to target towns, cities and civilians to win the war. But he says, let's be honest, that was a decision taken at the top and that the air crews themselves, people like you, he says, were in many ways victims. He says you were quoting him, he says you were sent out in often appalling conditions, in poor weather, with fear in your hearts, constantly aware of the hungry presence of death, he says. <laughs> Did you, and do you think that in a way you were a victim, or is that nonsense? No, never. I, I don't remember feeling afraid at any time. I don't remember feeling um, any apprehension at any time. That's very and hard to believe. You, you... And basically, because I had joined to do a job, and that job was all my concentration. And that was the only thing I thought about. I talked about Churchill, and you said you felt anger toward Churchill when he didn't think and salute the work of Bomber Command. In fact, you in Bomber Command were the one group of military personnel who were not given a campaign medal right after the war. Yeah. 
Does that still hurt? It does, very much so. It hurts more so now because there is so little, in fact no respect, no recognition of the individuals who were lost in Bomber Command fighting for the uh, their country, fighting for freedom, which we have been able to subsequently enjoy. You have spent a lot of time talking to particularly children about your experiences. What is it, what is the message that you want to give by taking so much time to talk to the new generation? You do ask the most awkward questions, don't you? <laughs> However, here goes. What's the message I want to give? I want, first of all, from the school's point of view, the children have a chance to appreciate the country they're living in, why they're living in it, and what it might have been had things gone the other way. I think it's part, an essential part, of their early education and something for them on which to think in the future. I didn't start talking about my war until after I lost my wife. And then the children suggested that I should start. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it would stop me grieving all the time for mum, as they put it. And I thought about it and I thought I'd try it. And it worked. Do you think that you speak about it with a, a sense of of pride in, in what you did, but do you also bring to it a feeling of, of perhaps horror, in a way, about what war is? After such a long life, things seem a little bit different now from what they were then. But at that time, I thought it was necessary that we should be fighting that war. And I thought it was necessary that we should fight it the best way we could. And Bomber Command was one of the advantages of that type of thought. I feel now I still feel privileged, even honoured, to have taken part in the Dam's Raid. I think that was the highlight of my operational career, and I shall always remember it as such. You have three children, you have grandchildren, and you even have great-grandchildren. Many of them. Many of them, <laughs> and I dare say you'll soon have another generation following them. Do you hope and do you believe that always the next generation here in U the UK will learn about the Dam Busters and the Dam Buster Raid? I mean, it's entered the national folklore, hasn't it? Some years ago, I said to my son, I think it's time we started forgetting about these things. <laughs> he said, you can't forget that, Dan. That's history. I said, I don't want to be bloody history. <laughs> but um, I find now that the, as I'm amazed at the interest that has developed over the last three or four years, not only in the Dam's Raid, in the war itself particularly and it seems to me that there is still a certain amount of interest if it is uh, still interesting to people good I'm glad if they don't forget it that's good too that's up to them but I find as far as I'm concerned I shall never forget it and that's really what it boils down to it's too prominent in my mind I was too prominent in my life at that time and has lived with me ever since. Johnny Johnson, we have to end there, but it has been a privilege to talk to you. Thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Well, I've enjoyed it. Thank you.